Good evening, and thank you for joining us for tonight's segment of our Parenting in a Pandemic Still series. I am Yechiel Bressler. I'm the Assistant Director of School-Based Programming at Madragos Midwest. And at Madragos, we have been hard at work exploring the needs of our teens and the community at large, recognizing the challenges that we are going through during this time period. While doing so, we also have recognized that a crucial piece to the well-being of our teens and children is the well-being of their parents. And for that reason, we have launched this series again, providing some insight and hopefully meaningful education and advice for parents as well. We have recently started a podcast at Madragos Midwest in which we have been posting, in addition to the YouTube channel, we have been posting these recordings on the podcast as well. So please go ahead and follow, if you are a podcast listener, follow the Madragos Midwest Mental Health Matters podcast, which can be found on all major platforms. And we hope beyond this series to continue for some informal programming as well. The reason that these programs have received positive feedback is because of our terrific presenters. And tonight is no different. As a new Chicagoan personally, I feel funny introducing someone who is a Rebbe, a Mechanich, and a mental health professional responsible for a huge percentage of the chinuch and growth of so many of the Chicago children. But for the sake of fulfilling my responsibility, I will do so anyway. Rabbi Shmuel Tenenbaum is the Mashkiach and Dean of Students at Yeshiva Stiferes Tzvi and a psychotherapist specializing in adolescent development and transition. Rabbi Tenenbaum is the founder of BigTalks.org, whose mission is to empower and enable parents to have sensitive conversations with their adolescent children. We are truly grateful to Rabbi Tenenbaum for taking this time out of his extraordinarily busy schedule always, and especially during this pandemic, and we appreciate his time and his preparation and his pre presentation, which we have, I am personally so looking forward to. A brief reminder that if anyone has questions and answers, we will have a few minutes for that at the end of the presentation. If you would like to ask that anonymously, you can use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen and to ask anonymously throughout the presentation or at the end. All that being said, I'm very excited. We are all very grateful to Rabbi Tenenbaum. And with that, I turn it over to Rabbi Tenenbaum for tonight's presentation. Okay. Am I on? You're good. All right, thank you so much. All right. Number one, I want to start off thanking Rabbi Bressler for your very kind words. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be part of uh, such a community and, 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 and your wonderful organization that you work for, Madragos. Uh, we've had a long history with working together with Madragos. They are a pillar in our community to helping children, adults, and the community at large. And I, I very much appreciate the fact that I was given the honor to be able to be a presenter this evening. So thank you, Madragos. May Kodesh Baruch give you the kaiches to be able to continue in helping the community and being a pillar of help to all. Um, at the same time, I feel privileged to be part of such a community, as I started off saying, Mika Amcha Yisrael. We know that we're in the middle of this pandemic, and it's quite difficult being part of the entire world being shaken up. Just the other week, we were hearing Yeshiva, Yeshiva Tver Tzvi, and it was about two days that we had approximately 21 staff members that were out. A revolving door. Staff members coming, some were out because they were being extra cautious. Some were exposed to COVID. Some actually had COVID. And it's a revolving door. It's teachers, staff members coming and going. Two days this past week, we had 21 staff members that were out. The outpour of love, care, and support that I received from the community was unbelievable. I have no administrators here in the building. We had representatives from all organizations. 
Thank you, Mrs. Berkowitz, Madregos, and all the other team members of Madregos that called, reached out. Rabbi Tenenbaum, do you need any help? Does the school need any help? Many organizations, many of the parents, many individuals just called out to offer support. And I realized that being there for each other, how fortunate we are to live in such a community that everyone cares for everyone else. I also realized that the best way for us as adults to be able to cope with this pandemic is to be the one to offer support to others. I felt supported by the community when we were playing solo here in the school. And I felt how beautiful it is to be the one giving the chizuk, giving the call, checking in with someone else. Giving is actually taking. The more we give to the community, the more we receive. And it's not my own line. I actually saw it in Parshish Kisisa, the Pasuk brings down, when it was time to give the machtis shekel. They were collecting the shkalim, and the word that the Torah uses, v'nasnu ish koifer. The word v'nasnu, and everyone gave their shekel, they gave their donation, they gave the tzedakah to the mishkan to be able to buy kabanis. The word v'nasnu is a palindrome. You can read it backwards and frontwards. You spell it vav, nun, saf, nun, vav. V'nasnu. Whatever you give, you ultimately take. Svar Magdashim right. You're never giving and losing out. What you give to others, you're taking for yourself. And you can say that we're, our presentation tonight is going to be geared to what we can give to our children. Yet whatever you're going to be giving to your children, you're ultimately taking for yourself. And at any time you feel overwhelmed yourself, how can I be the caregiver? How can I take care of my children? I am anxious. I feel overwhelmed. There is too many changes going on. There's too many transitions and adjustments going on. How am I going to manage my own feelings? And as I feel, the more you give to others, the more you'll be able to deal with yourself. So at any time, and I do this myself, when I feel a bit overwhelmed, who can, I go through my contacts list. Who can I send an email that I'm thinking about you? Who can I send a text message? I'm here for you if you need anything. And the more I give for others, the more mechuzik I feel. That's the venasnu. Interestingly enough, as I was going through it today, and I thought about this palindrome, I had two Talmudim that came to my office to ask. They had a concern. They wanted to discuss a concern. So I asked the two of them, do you know what the word palindrome means? And they said, no. I said, the word palindrome is, means when you can read a word frontwards and backwards. So I asked them, how about if you think of a few words that you can read backwards and frontwards. And one boy said, yeah, I can think of one. Mom, mom, you're right. And the next boy pops up, I can also think of one, dad. Mom and dad, you can read both ways. And I told him, you know what? You just enlightened me. Mom and dad are two words, just as Vinasnu, the more you give, the more you take. You give for others, you take for yourself. Whatever a mom and dad puts into their children, their children will in return have those skills. You will receive, you'll be on the receiving end of the nachas. You learn from all your tamidim, and I just learned from my two tamidim that, interestingly enough, I was thinking of a nasnu. Mom and dad have the same ability. The more you give to your children, the more you will take back. So I want to discuss what's considered giving to your children, because sometimes you think, let's just give and give and give and give. So we're going to be discussing the idea of healthy giving versus unhealthy giving. We're going to be discussing a bit emotional giving and thoughtful giving. There is a big difference between giving out of emotions and giving out of thought. Before we start the presentation, I have to make a disclaimer. Yiddish is my first language, so my mom illusion. And I may make some, grammat I may make some grammatical mistakes. So I ask everyone, please do not judge the content of this presentation based on my grammatical mistakes. Also thinking now, today was a bit of a chilly day. It's cold outside, it's rainy outside. And we have many people that are here gathered together to listen to some words of chizuk and words of some tips and hopefully some skills that you can take home to help out your children. It's not 8.30, 8.40 at night here in, 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 in Chicago and those that are on the East Coast, it's 9.40 at night. It's not the night that you would choose to come listen to a presentation. 
we'd much rather sit by the fireplace now and then maybe watch Sean more entertaining than Rabbi Tenenbaum. So again, I do feel grateful for all of you that are joining tonight and hopefully a great chizik will come out of this presentation. What's considered healthy giving? Before I get to healthy giving and the title was how much more can they take increasing resilience in our children, I wanna discuss what builds resilience, the definition of resilience, this we're gonna be discussing from Dr. Kenneth Ginsberg. Dr. Kenneth Ginsberg came up with the seven practical C's of building resilience. And before I get to the resilience component, I do wanna to touch upon a few incidents that happened recently here in school that can give you an idea of unhealthy giving. We think sometimes you wanna to give to our children. Let's discuss first the unhealthy giving, and then we're gonna come back to the healthy giving, which is building the resilience in our children. As a parent, you wanna make sure your child has everything that they need. And imagine you get a phone call in the middle of the day, even though we have a policy that we don't call home for lunches, my child didn't get lunch. He forgot to, child forgot to bring lunch that day. So he calls mom, do me a favor, mom, I'm out of lunch. Please pick me up some lunch. Mom at home thinking, poor child, he's in school. School is hard. He doesn't have lunch. Let me go get him a lunch. She runs by to the Dunkin' Donuts there. She gets him some kosher food and she brings to school a big bag of Dunkin' Donuts. This big drink, the gulp size drink, and she's here to give to her son who she cares so much about his lunch. Now think for a second, the boy looks at his mom, wow, special, really special mom. The boy walks into his class with that big gulp and that big bag of Dunkin' Donuts. What do the classmates think? What a great mom he has. I'm so happy for Yaakov that he got this delicious lunch. Or, hey, eh, why is he so spoiled that he gets that? I never get that. Now, my, my child needed a lunch and I'm not home. I couldn't uh, make a sandwich. So he needed to, so I, what, what's wrong? Yet if this would be a thoughtful giving, you would think for a minute, if I'm bringing to my child there are 550 other boys in that building or whatever school you send your child to. The ones that are gonna watch him eat it or watch her eat it, what are they thinking? Is this child going to remember tomorrow that mom brought him that delicious lunch? So what do you do? I had the other day a mom called me, Rabbi Tenenbaum, I feel terrible. I told my son I'm gonna bring him lunch. It was hectic in the morning. I, I wasn't able to bring him. Can I come bring him lunch right now? So I told mom, it depends what you wanna bring him. If you want to bring him just a sandwich wrapped up in a piece of silver foil in a brown bag, color kavod, you can come now, you can bring it. But if you're going to bring him a Dunkin' Donuts or a, um, a Lincoln Cafe uh, or a, a Bond lunch, then I'll be waiting for you outside. I'll bring it up to my office, allow him to eat it here in the office. I will allow him to eat up in the, here in my office. And when he's done, he'll go back to class. And little did I know that that's exactly what mom had. She brought this huge drink, this huge big bag. And is that called thoughtful giving? Now, the thoughtful adult understands that if I'm giving to my child, will my child gain friends with what I'm giving him? Or would it create bickering? Would it create jealousy? Which in effect, I am ultimately the one that is hurting my child long-term by thinking that I'm giving him something now through emotional giving, I'm helping something short-term, yet with a long-term effect. So we have to start being thoughtful when we deal with our children. Are we dealing out of emotions or are we dealing out, dealing out of seichel, out of thought? One incident, another incident. The past few days with Tom in the office, his stomach, his stomach aches. He's not feeling well, his stomach hurts, he's, very, he's in pain. What's going on? A pre-1A child. What's going on? Okay, we made him feel comfortable two days ago, yesterday. Today, a third day in a row, he's coming with stomach pains. And we had checked him out by the nurse. And it doesn't seem like it's anything physical. And I asked the boy, tell me what's going on. So he tells me, my stomach hurts. 
what, what could be the cause? Did he have breakfast? Had breakfast? And then the same routine questions. And then he asked me, Rabbi Tenenbaum, do you know that people are dying? I said, oh, really? What's going on? He said, you know, the people are dying because of COVID. A pre one child that's coming to my office three days in a row, because the presenting problem is a stomachache. The underlying problem is in his mind, people are dying. There is a fear that people are dying. So I asked him, who told you that people are dying? Oh, a few days ago, I went to my Bobby and my Bobby told me that I must wear the mask because people are dying. Now it is very important to wear a mask and we encourage, and not only encourage, we enforce everyone to be wearing masks. Yet if the wearing the mask is presented in a way out of fear that you're scaring the child, you are freezing the child, the child can't do anything. He can't sit in the class, he can't walk it. So when you have this Bobby who really cares about a grandson and is telling her, wear that mask, otherwise, because people are dying, what you're doing is you're crippling this poor child. We think that we're giving him great advice. Be careful. Ultimately, the child comes to the building, he can't sit, people are dying. And when this pre one child thinks people are dying, you know who he thinks is dying first. He thinks it's gonna be his parents, they're gonna be dying. He thinks it's gonna be him dying. And you know what he cares about if his parents die? Who's gonna be making my birthday party? Who's gonna be buying my balloons? The stress that this child is going through, the anxiety that this child is living, because someone told him, be careful to wear the mask because people are dying. Not developmentally. You don't tell a pre-1A child about people dying. Now you have kids that are older. You want to be able to, they need more of an explanation. You could be, and a middle school kid came into my office, Robert Tenenbaum. What's a ventilator? Why? Why are you asking about a ventilator? I heard that this and this member in the community is on a ventilator. And I, I he can't sit still. He can't sit in class because he's, all that he's thinking about is a ventilator. Now, when we're sharing information with children and we want to give our kids the information that they need, you have to think for a second, is this emotional giving or it's thoughtful giving? Is it developmentally appropriate for this child to be able to comprehend what a ventilator does, what it means, how it's helping the person? Or we're there to scare the child. People are dying, people are on ventilators, people are in the hospital, people are... Our job is to create a cautious and relaxing environment for our children, not to scare them. Beginning of the school year, before school started, I got a phone call from a parent. The parent calls me, Rabbi Tenenbaum, my kid is afraid to come to school. He doesn't want, he's afraid that he's gonna catch COVID in school and, 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 and uh, he's, he's full of anxiety. So he said to me, if I haven't come to my office the first day of school, I wanna to talk to him about it, let's have a discussion. Okay, first day of school, he did not come. He came to school, he didn't come to speak to me about it. The next day he comes to my office and I said, Tzadik, I wanna hear from you, what's going on? I hear you. He says, Rabbi Tenenbaum, I feel like someone is gonna die. I said, what's going on? If I catch COVID, one of my family members are gonna die. I said, really? What's going on? Talk to me about it. My mother is expecting. And if I catch COVID, she's gonna die. I said, I'm so happy to hear about your mother. I feel terrible about the concerns that you're living with, the fears that you're living with. Let's, let's discuss this with the nurse. Hashem, we're privileged to have Mrs. Nubiger as our nurse, who's so caring and so empathic to every child. We went down, we discussed the risks of a pregnant woman and, and uh, COVID, and we made him feel a bit better. The next week, Mazel Tov, his mother had a baby. I changed a bit the story. The mother had a baby and everyone is freed and everyone is happy. Next week, Rebbe comes over to me. Rabbi Tanabam, we have an issue. The boy in our class insists that he doesn't want to wear the mask. Not in the class, not in the hallway, wherever he goes. I, I, I keep on, I'm busy during my class trying to get him to put on the mask rather than teaching the class. So I ask, who's this boy? And he tells me this boy's name. I call the boy, ask, what's going on? You know, you were so careful before school started to be, yeah, I needed to wear the mask because I didn't want my mother to be harmed. But now that my mother had the baby, I don't have to wear the mask anymore. Now, the more pressure he's gotten from home about wearing the mask, the more he's going to take off the mask and make our job harder. So I'm not afraid of working hard. That's not what I'm afraid. But what's this fear, the anxiety this child is living through by the subtle messages 
the subconscious messages that we're giving to our children that they should be afraid, that they should be, af- they should live in fear. We want to give, we want to build our children. We want to give them healthy skills that's needed to be able to withstand the challenges that the world is going through right now and being able to ace it with flying colors and stand, stay strong. Okay, so now we're gonna to move to the, we spoke about the unhealthy giving, which are really creating anxiety. And I don't blame anyone because the adults are struggling. And sometimes adults don't know how to get the message across to their children. And they may think that by putting that fear, that will solve the issue. But instead, it's crippling the children rather than giving them the skills how to deal with it and how to be safe. So let's talk about resilience. What is resilience? And I'm sure that there are now since COVID started, many, many lecturers are talking about it. I want to give the a short definition of the word resilience, which is posted on psychology today. They write: resilience is the ability to bounce back from a challenging event. COVID is a challenging event. There are many challenging events that everyone in life will go through. The question is, do they have the skills to bounce back to normal life? Now, I wanna read something from the American Psychological Association. Resilience is not a trait that people either have or do not have. It involves behaviors, thoughts, and actions that can be learned and developed in anyone. We can develop resilience. One more, actually two more, one from Harvard University Center on the developing child. The the single most common factor for children who develop resilience is at least one stable and committed relationship with with a supportive parent, caregiver, or adult. You wanna know what's the most sing- the single most common factor to develop resilience is that relationship that the child has with a supportive parent, caregiver, or adult. Now, many times we'll see a child that does very well in school, and then when he comes home, he does not do well. And many times you see the opposite, a child does not do well in school, and when they come home, they do very well. Different children have different needs and function in different ways. School was usually more structured you know what you do at nine o'clock, you know what you do at 10 o'clock, there's a schedule, there's a system in place. Um, school is more rigid, you have to conform, there are things that you have to do. Some children strive on that, they need that structure. Home is usually more loose, not that many expectations, it's not as structured. So children that need the structure may do much better in school. Children that have a hard time with the structure, will do much better at home. And both type of children are great and we love them dearly and we work with them and you as parents work with them. Things have shifted now. In the child's mind, when the school was structured and was very predictable, currently it's not so predictable because the boy doesn't know. I talk about boys because I'm in a boys school. I'm referring to boys and girls and everyone else. Children don't know Who's going to be in the class the next day and who's not going to be in the class? It could be that some people, some boys, some children in the class have to be quarantined. Some of the adults may have to be quarantined. So when I'm used to a certain structure and currently, oh, I don't know who's going to be, who's not going to be, school is not anymore so predictable. So for the child that needs that structure, that needs the predictability, is currently in a quantity because he may not be feeling so comfortable in school. So when he comes home and he didn't have a good day in school, he may act out at home. So if he needs that structure and school camp, we still have providing a certain level of structure, yet there's an uncertainty that the child may be feeling. And a child that has some anxiety will feel a much higher level of anxiety now because he needs that structure, he strives off that structure. And currently he doesn't know if his rebbe will be back tomorrow or not. He may be in quarantine, he may have COVID. Someone else may catch COVID. So that predictability is not here anymore. Home has to take over that, that area of comfort. The child, the child is always lucky. They have two stru- they have two structures, school and home. If one of the structures don't work, at least we have to make sure the other structure works. Baruch Hashem, the boys that we see here in school, it's working. Yet, they're missing something. They're missing the pre- predictability. So at home, they have to know that whatever's going to happen, we're here to support you, we're here to love you, we're here to care for you. And the single most common factor is that connection, that relationship that they have with their parent or caregiver, and the parent could create that relationship with the child. 
Resilience is a muscle we can build. It's not something which, okay, I'm going to teach you to be resilient. It's a muscle that we can build. So I want to go back now to what I mentioned before, uh, the seven C's that help build resilience in children. So I'm going to go through first the, first, the seven C's, and then I want to touch upon each of them. I don't have much time here, but I definitely, uh, I'll be happy with questions afterwards. The seven C's, if you want to write them down. C number one is competence. C number two is confidence. C number three is connection. Number four is character. Number five is contribution. Number six is coping. And number seven is control. Again, number one, competence. Number two is confidence. Number three, connection. Number four, character. Number five, contribution. Number six, coping. And number seven, control. Competence. Every ch- Now, there's a big difference between competence and confidence. Competence is something that the child actually knows. It's a skill that the child has, and you make them feel good based on a certain skill that they have. Confidence is building children's confidence, not necessarily they master a skill, yet you're giving them the confidence they should be able to master a skill by building them up. So competence is every... We want to encourage our children to focus, to build on their strengths. Every child has certain strengths. And if you don't know the strengths of your child, make sure you spend some time talking to your children. Find out what your child's favorite color is. Find out what your child's favorite game is. Find out something, a hobby that your child likes doing. So to find a strength in your child and build upon that strength. I have here in my office drawings that Hamidim drew, whether it's a picture of Rabbi Tenenbaum or it's a picture of a bird or it's a picture, and I display their accomplishments. If you look right behind me, actually, on top of my closet over there, you can see some trophies. No, I did not earn those trophies. No. Those trophies belong to certain Tamidim in the yeshiva that were part of a chess tournament. And whenever they won the chess tournament, they got a trophy and they shared it with me and I display it up there. I display our Tamidim's accomplishments. As parents, you want to display their accomplishment. Your child knows how to draw. You compliment them, you hang it up, you do, you show them that you appreciate. That builds competence in children. I know I can do something. And even if it's not wrong, I can sing, you can drum, any, play musical instruments, uh, martial arts, anything that they can do, a talent, they like cooking, baking, Try to find something that they can do and build their confidence. Number two is confidence. We want to build our children's confidence. And sometimes our children mess up. They slip up. The other day, the child never spilled the bottle of milk. He was taking the milk from the refrigerator to the kitchen table to pour milk in the, in the cereal. And he dropped the bottle of milk. As a parent, what is our reaction? You shlamazel, you shlamail, you... Or it's okay. We're going to clean it up. We have more wilt. Don't worry about it. And at a different time, you can let them know, let's be more careful when we, but not then, because then by, you'll be crushing their confidence. They feel bad about it. So you don't only have to focus on their achievements, but in, encourage fairness. Well, let's understand what's fair. Integrity, persistence, kindness. These are all things that you can bring out the children and, 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 and wow, that was so kind of you. That was so nice of you. Praise them honestly. Don't make up praises because then they make, have a felt a false sense of, 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 of uh, themselves. You see a child drew a nice picture. Instead of saying you're a great artist, I actually like the colors that you use. The brown matches very well with the, with, I'm colorblind. So uh, for me, my children know that I can't make a compliment. I can't give a compliment like that, color deficient. Yet, if you do understand color, wow, I actually like the way you did it. Instead of saying it's beautiful, that shows them that the, it, it's true, it's truthful, and it builds their confidence. And again, the seven ingredients that we're saying now are the ingredients that will build resilience in children. So if you want to build, you want to bake a delicious cake, you need ingredients to build to make that cake. You can't just decide, okay, I want a cake and I'll have a cake. I want a resilient child. I'm going to have a resilient child. I'm going to make my child resilient. No, it takes thought and it takes planning. Competence is number one. We're going to find something that they're good with. Confidence. We're going to build their confidence with, with, with things that we they try to do, and we're going to make them feel good. 
Connection. Children need a connection. They need to know that they can talk to their parents. They need to know that they can have a relationship with their parents. They need to know that their parents understand them. Not only how is your day. So tell me, in school today, was there uh, any conversation about um, something that's going on? What's and, and, and what's your feeling? What's your take on it? They need a connection. Children need to have a connection, a positive connection, something that they could express their emotions to their parents. And the best way to get children to talk to parents is if parents talk to children. If sometimes you can you come, a child comes on me by the dinner table and you tell your child, you know what, I had a bit of a hard day. I was a, I was a bit overwhelmed because I had so many things to do. And you know what, Ms. Yata Dishmai, we're able to overcome everything. You're modeling, sharing your feelings in a way where your child says, you know what, not only I get overwhelmed, the adults get overwhelmed as well. And this is how they deal with it. The connection, that builds a connection between child and adult where, wow, it's not only us that are struggling, parents could also be struggling and they teach us coping skills, which we're gonna get soon. So again, this was connection. The children need a connection and they need a positive connection, not a connection of um, uh, one of the stories that happened recently, Just a, a mind boggling story that breaks all the seven C's that we said before. Everyone needs a break and, I, and I'm gonna to get to the rest of the C's, but this story, everyone needs a break. There were parents that went on a vacation. They went to the Bahamas or wherever they went on vacation, or maybe now Dubai is a hot spot. They went to Dubai. I'm changing the story so that if the parent is listening, they don't get offended. I don't want to offend anyone. Just listen to the story. They went on a vacation. They came back from vacation on a Thursday. And that weekend, the school gave off. Friday and Sunday, we gave off as a mental health day for our staff members that they could rejuvenate and come back healthy again. Mom, when she heard that the school is giving a mental health day and these kids are gonna be all home again, Friday and Sunday, posted on social media a message. I don't have the exact word, but I'm paraphrasing the message. We needed a vacation because our, ch our children were quarantined for two weeks. Finally, we got a vacation, and now we come home, and they're home again? Now, I didn't see firsthand the social media post. If I heard about it, I'm sure the children know the mother's feeling. The mother's feeling is that when children are home, I need a vacation from them, and finally they're home again, so what, did, what was my vacation worth? So you're away for a week, you're away from Monday to Thursday, almost a week. You come home and you hear that your children are home for two more days. They get so overwhelmed, they post on social media, oh, my children are gonna be home now again. Do you give a message of confidence to your kids? Do you give a message of connection to your children? Is that the message that the children are gonna walk away while mommy cares about me? Let's change the wording a bit differently to a healthy giving, a healthy message. Mommy and Tati, need a break so we can give the children everything that they need. We love you dearly. And in order to be able to give you and have the kayak, we need a break. So we're going on a vacation. We're so lucky that after spending a week away from you, that we can spend another two days with you after we rejuvenate and after we have the kayak. I encourage people to go on vacations, notify the school, because when the parents are on vacation, we find out from the way the child acts. So if we're prepared for it, we know how to deal, we know how to give them the support, we know how to give them the extra TLC. So, so let us know beforehand. We don't frown upon vacation. I send people on vacation. I also go on vacation, don't worry. Yet the message that you're giving over to your kids could have been such a healthy message, a message of connection. I love you dearly. But in order for me to be able to give you everything that I need, I need a break. C number four, character. Character, every family has something that they stand for, should have something that they stand for. Character traits, certain meters, certain personalities. We wanna teach our children that our family, we, we act a certain way. We're respectful to people. We care about people. We're, we're there to, to help people. And whenever, if we give over the message of character, we talk to our children what type of behavior, that our behaviors could affect other people. And that's why we're careful to be respectful to all people, even though we don't have the same mindset, and even though we come from a different background, and even if we have different sheetas in, 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 in everything in the world, whether we feel that this he should be president or the other person, we respect everyone. 
That teaches character to the children. Number five, contribution. It's very healthy for children to contribute something to the world. So if your child can contribute to do something for someone else, volunteer for an organization, bake a cake, write a letter, contribute to someone, not only you go through your text message and have your, your child call another friend, how are you dealing with this? How's everything coming along? If you contribute, if you give a national mom and dad, backwards, frontwards, the more you give, the more you get. Number six is coping skills. Coping skills, you wanna model coping skills. And as I said before with connection, you wanna to talk to your children. Everyone has difficult days. Let's teach our children how we cope with our challenge. How did we deal with things? Don't allow the children to be exposed to the media. You get clips, you get a picture over here, you get a picture over there. There was a, this happened here, this happened there. One day the, the Talmud came in all shaken up that, that uh, what's gonna happen? Biden is gonna dismantle the Israeli army. What are you talking about? Where's this coming from? The kid is picking up news. And you are having an innocent conversation with another adult and the kid hears everything. So the message that we have, we have to make sure that a kid gets them, don't expose them to the news, expose them to good things, give them skills, allow them the coping skills that you use. What do you do when you, when you have a hard time? It is great to have an emotional temperature. One day I will invent an emotional temperature that we can take our own temperature to see, are we feeling anxious? Are we feeling nervous? What message are we giving over? What, and I'm not a subconscious message. So is this ch children understanding the difference between a real crisis and something that just feels like one of the moment? Coping skills, all part of coping skill. Model step-by-step -step problem solving. Avoid reacting emotionally when you're overwhelmed. When you're overwhelmed, you could let your children know, I need a few minutes break. You're entitled as a mom, as a dad, you're entitled to take a break and you're entitled to notify a child, I really want to give you everything that you deserve. I just need a few minutes of myself. That's coping skills. Control. Children have to feel that they have some sense of control. You give them a choice. Would you rather want this? You rather want that? You want to go to sleep now? You want to go to sleep in 10 minutes from now? You want to give them some small choices to make that they feel that you trust them. And the more they gain the trust, the more choices you allow them to make. If everything is, you're gonna follow the way I say, you're gonna do whatever I tell you to do, that doesn't help with control. That doesn't help with the child feeling a sense of a crisis, a sense of control. Allow them to make small decisions. If you allow them to make small decisions, they're gonna make smart decisions later on as well. And again, these seven C's, the competence, the confidence, the connection, the character, contribution, coping and control, if we give these to our children and we're cognizant that our kids need it, it will create a delicious cake called resilience. That if the child is faced with a hardship and he'll have the skills to bounce back and come back and do what's expected of him to do. I wanna finish off with the wording that we use is so important. We just started Mesechtas Psachim, Orla Ba Asr. And I spoke to the Talmudim this morning about it. Or labo also is referring to or really means light, which refers to day. But here in the Gemara refers to the night of Abba also, the night of the 14th of Nisan when you do Badikas Chametz. So the word or is referring to night. So the Gemara asks if or means the translation of or is light, why is it referring to night? And the Gemara comes to Maskana, discusses about the concept of using Losha in the Kia. We want to use a clean Losha, a, a, a nice Lushan. So when people talk about night, it reflects darkness. It reflects overwhelmingness. And that's not what we want to portray. We want to portray light. And everything that Kodesh Baruch gives us, there's a certain level of light behind it. Or la ba'asar, the night before the 14th of Nisan, the Nisan Nigal of Nisan Sinigal, there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's not dark. We may be going through a challenge. The terminology that we use at home, should not be, people are dying. People are ventilators. The president is this, that. Don't bring anxiety into the house. Don't expose them to anxiety. Use a calm way of expressing something. Use all the C's. That will help the child build that resilience that when he's faced with a challenge, not only now during COVID, COVID is going to pass. The emotional effect of scaring children of fear will last with the kids. If we give them resiliency, we give them the skills that's needed, then they will have the skills 
for life, way past COVID, to be able to deal with any challenge that comes along their way. Now adults, it's very hard. We are overwhelmed. We have a lot on our plates. Self-care, take care of yourself. Take time for yourself. And don't feel guilty taking time for yourself. And if you need help, reach out. We are happy to help people take time for themselves and, 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 and help in whichever way we can so that you can take care of yourself. If you take care of yourself, you'll be healthier to be able to take care of your children, give your children the, the care that they need so they don't walk around with fear and they're not scared. They walk around as wholesome people. And if there's anything that I can um, add, feel free to ask. We'll open up the questions now. And if anyone wants to uh, reach out to me, you could my personal email or my work, bigtalks.org. You can email me there and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for Tenenbaum. Really extremely insightful. And uh, speaking of choosing our words carefully, you clearly took the time to do that, and we are really appreciative, again, for, for the time and the insight that you've provided. Um, we do have one or two, two questions to address. Um, the first is, you mentioned in terms of parents being open and speaking with their children about their own failures. And my, my question is, how detailed does one get into that, right? Meaning, I would imagine that Clearly, the, the, the point is very clear of the, the necessity for the children to see that parents struggle and work through their struggle. But how, how far would you go with that? Details are not important. I'm um, sorry. Details are important. <laughs> when describing personal struggles or when describing what's going on in the news, the details are not important. You can let them know I had a rough day today. Let me tell you how I overcame the rough day. You can let them know that there's yidden that need feelings. When you're davening, have a mind call as well. They don't need to know who's in the hospital. They don't need to know who's on a ventilator. They don't need to know who is struggling with other sicknesses. They need to know that Israel needs Yeshua's. And we're here to daven for them. We're here to learn. The details of what happened, exactly how it happened, and that just creates fear. Because when a child hears details of a story, they're envisioning something very different. They're not thinking the same way the adult is thinking. So when we start talking to them, oh, it's just, you know, whatever, whatever, the kid starts going into his own world and he could be walking around and he could be thinking for the rest of the day, what does that mean? When someone's talking about the hospital, the last time I know someone's in the hospital was either Bobby who didn't come home or it's mommy who came home with a baby. So what's happening? Is mommy going to come home with a baby? They may not have the smart, and even older children, they walk around with fear. The more details we give them with what's going on. Uh, one other one other question is when we talk about that it's normal for everyone to fail and to work through it, and especially during these times. So then, how can I determine when is it appropriate to reach out to a rebbe, to reach out to an administ administrator, or even reach out to a therapist? Uh, when, when what's normal and when do they need help? I know it's a, a loaded question, but. I, I like that question. Uh, I, I think it is extremely important for parents to have the, com the comfort level to reach out to an administrator or to a Rebbe anytime possible. Even if, should I take my child out for lunch? I think he needs it. And if yes, when should we take it out? I got a phone call the other day from a boy asking, there's a sports game that's going on and his parents want to take him. Is it okay if he goes or, if okay, or he shouldn't be going? And we're not Mr. Frumis to tell people, no, 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 no. We will take the child in full consideration. We will, we, we will think it out. When my kid asks me for something, and I'm, when it comes to someone else's kid, I may, have, I may think that I have all the answers. I know one thing, that when it comes to my kids, I don't have any answers. So when my child asks me a question, I'll say, you know what? I don't have the answer to that. I'm going to reach out to your principal. I'm going to reach out to your teacher. I'm going to ask them. So asking, you're always, much, you're always safer. And please notify us when you're going on vacation. We won't be jealous. We're, we're going to be happy for you that you're going because we know that you're going to rejuvenate and your kids are going to have healthier parents afterwards. Always call. Call, let us know, is this normal? Is this not normal? Normal behavior, not normal behavior. Another Nukud I wanted to say, which I actually speaking Thursday and I go to West Rogers Park and I'm going to bring out that Nukud over there. When it comes to our own children, it, it, I wrote it down somewhere actually for the next speech. Yeah. 
I'm sorry. When it comes to our own, once Yaakov, once Yitzchak got deceived by Esau, Esau came to ask questions about how to be mice and uh, salt. And, uh, so so he, got, he was deceived by Yitzchak. Once Esau deceived Yitzchak, no parent can fully understand their child. No parent can see their child's wrongs. Here it is, I'm sorry. Here, brings down. Vayev Yitzchak as Esau. Yitzchak loved Esau. Zot Reb Mechel Mizlotchev in the name of the Heilig of Baal Shem Tov. Shemiyoyim Shirimo Esau as Yitzchak. The day that Esau fooled Yitzchak, Yigram, he was Goyrim, he caused. She'en shum tzadik yuchel lirais al benoi shum dvar ra. No tzaddik can see anything bad about their child. You know what that means? It's a beautiful thing that we always, we think very highly of our children, which we should, not falsely, but uh, no tzaddik can see anything wrong with the child. So if school calls you that we have a concern, we're not looking for concerns. We're looking to make sure the children don't fall through the cracks. So feel free to call the school. What do you feel about my child? I don't fully understand my child. I'm blinded because no tzaddik can fully understand a child. If you fully understand your child, you may not fall under the category of a tzaddik. But I trust that you are, we're all tzaddikim and we cannot possibly fully understand or see the bad in our children. So reach out to the school, find out what can we do to help our kids. We don't even see bad in kids. We see kids that may need help. Fantastic. Ritenbaum, thank you again so, so much for your time and your insight and everything you do for, for the Chicago community and for, for Klaus Yisrael. And it's really been a pleasure listening and uh, really thank you for your time and your preparation. Th thank you for the honor again. Greatly appreciate it. May we each share in our own simchas and our own nachas and we be zeichet to this pandemic to be over and everyone should have the strength to deal with it and we should have the strength and the ability to make cognizant, clear, thoughtful decisions for our children. Amen. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone. You too. Thank you. Okay, baby.